Hey, we are live. Welcome back to another edition of Elevate Your Grind brought to you by the Canada's Bat Lab. I am your host, Todd Rosales, and thank you all for joining me so much today. Really great to be back in front of you, getting back into the mix, and excited to be your host, folks. Before we get started, this podcast is brought to you by Contempo Specialty Packaging. Everybody knows that packaging in the cannabis industry is the worst. Every time you go and buy something, there's usually a ton of layers between you and the product. It creates a ton of waste. It is a pain in the ass. I know it's supposed to be childproof, but they're adult proofing it at this point, and it needs to get better. That's where Contempo Specialty Packaging comes in with their packaging made of 100% hemp. That's right, folks. We're finally wrapping cannabis in cannabis, this industry is more about more than just the cannabis that you consume, everybody. Contempo comes from 40 years of packaging background, servicing the top brands in the world of fashion, and has over four years of cannabis packaging experience. They work with many of the largest cannabis operators in the industry, and their packaging is beautiful. Actually, in an episode or two, we'll have some packaging to show you. I love these guys. I'm, I'm talking to them right now about some things that I'm doing. I'm really excited to work with them. And their 100% hemp packaging is just one of their exciting offers. If you're looking for beautiful child-resistant packaging for any or all of your cannabis products, visit contempopackaging.com. I can tell you firsthand their packaging is beautiful. The options are exceptional. And we are very proud to have them as our sponsor. Please visit contempopackaging.com. That is contempopackaging.com and tell them that C Lab sent you. They will send you samples along with their newest brochure, and you'll see right away why they're trusted by so many major cannabis brands and so many guests of Elevate Your Grind. So thank you to Contempo. And folks, we've got another great episode for you today. I'm definitely going to start cutting down on these intros because now that we have sponsors, I don't get as much free time to talk. So without further ado, I'm very happy to welcome our guest today. We're going to talk about so many different things in the industry. I've talked about the year of M&A happening in 2020. Well, it didn't really happen the way that we thought it would. 2021 seems to be changing. Actually, the end of 2020 really picked up. So I've got someone who's in the mix on that, can give us a whole lot of updates on the industry, talk about you know, the differences in the early days versus today, seeing the little mom and pop stores grow into these massive MSOs. So please welcome my guest today, Sean Coyle of Fox, Fox Rothschild. Sean, thank you for joining me, man. Happy to be here. I appreciate it. And I, I appreciate you working through me with the rusty intros here. I, six weeks off apparently is a lot of time to take. So Sean, man. I, I you, thought you nailed it. <laughs> oh, I appreciate it, dude. So, I mean, listen, You've been in the cannabis space for a long time, right? And, and I have now have a crusade against the cannabis dog ears joke, so I'm not going to let you use that one. But you know, you, you've kind of seen the, the beginning of it here. You, you've been involved on the corporate side of things. You know, what are the trends that you're seeing now in the cannabis space? A lot of the things that you're working on versus, versus what you saw in the early days. I mean, in the early days, I feel like you were almost a godsend to people because there was a lot of regulatory framework that people who we're not used to working within any regulatory framework. We're now having to, you know, deal with versus now you truly have corporations that are cannabis companies that work as multinational corporations. Give us just kind of like a summary of, of how you've seen this industry progress so far. Well, you know, it's funny you bring up the regulators. You brought me back to an old memory, which was the first uh, real cannabis deal that I did the regulator, and I'll leave the state out of it, uh, didn't even have a system to process a change of control. Wow. So, so you had licensees and you, you had a sale and you, you went to the state and said, okay, you know, tell us what we need to fill out, what we need to give you. And they came back with, uh, we don't really have anything for that. And so they said, here's what you can do. And, you know, we actually had to set it up where you separated the voting and the economics. And then so the so the voting power went over and, you know, some of the or the economics went over, the voting power stayed back. And then you had this like put that would occur, you know, once the regulators got their stuff together and could actually process a change of control. Um, it, see, that but, that kind of stuff to me is really crazy because like. You know, when in the early days, you're, you're dealing with these regulators, right? And I think a lot of us in the industry, especially those that are not directly involved in it, we get 
frustrated, right? We get frustrated that things aren't progressing. We get frustrated that things are held up, especially in government, not realizing that these are the same folks who created the DMV and the social security card that, <laughs> that rips in your pocket. But on that point is it feels like to me in the early days, a lot of it was more people like you collaborating with like regulators versus kind of either fighting them or, or, you know, I feel like together you guys were kind of shaping this because no one knew what they were doing. I don't think people realize on the other end of it, like these politicians and, and policymakers, they're also humans doing a job too. And this is the first time that it's been legalized in that geography and they want to do it right. They always, you know, the path to hell is paved with good intentions, but you know, it was there a lot of more collaboration early on, or was it dealing with a lot of people who didn't know what the hell they were doing and just being frustrated with it. And, and you know, you can be political, so we don't get too many people mad at you, but yeah, I, I would say it's a mix. It would fall a lot to the regulator's personality and who is sitting at the top, whether they would work with you or would basically develop some level of defensiveness, probably out of some insecurity and would, you know, make it, make it difficult for you. Um, you know, the good thing now is a lot of that first wave of regulators have kind of come and gone and you're seeing, you know, regulators that have a track record, have a history, have a system and are able to apply it. Um, of course, now it's generally harder to get regulators to think outside the box because they've uh, in their mind built themselves such a nice box. But, uh, <laughs> that's, <laughs> but really that's, that's kind of that's what you uh, run into now. There's more framework, there's more history, but that could also work against you in the context of a deal in that people are a lot less willing to get creative and be helpful. Got it. So let's back it up now because I want I want to give your background because you've you've had a really cool career, at least from what I can tell on paper. Now, folks, ladies and gentlemen, when your parents push you to be a doctor or a lawyer, of course, it sounds like a very boring path. But the gentleman on the other end of this camera here has worked in both sports and in cannabis. To me, those sound like some pretty cool industries to work in. Yes, you have to deal with the legal and regulatory part of it, but you get to be involved in some pretty cool things, right? So when you, when you see lawyers on TV that are in trial, you know, defense lawyers, honestly, at this point, after dealing with so many corporate attorneys, I feel like they have the boring part of the job where they're just arguing with people in court. Someone like you gets to negotiate stadium deals and, and trades and and M&As of massive companies, that sounds like a whole lot more fun and you don't have to put on a performance in a courtroom. So with that being said, give us a little bit of your background, you know, getting into the law and, and getting into the sports world and how that kind of ultimately led you to where you are, you know, in the cannabis space. Well, I, I realized I wanted to do this from a relatively early age. Um, my father was an attorney. Uh, he actually retired the day I graduated law school. But he told me, he's not like, to, I, hey, you can you can take it from here, son. I'm good. No, he told me not to become an attorney. He told me to be an entrepreneur, but that's not in and of itself an actual job. So <laughs> so I, uh, you know, my my path was always leading toward law school. It was where it would go from there that has kind of changed over time. I thought I would use it as sort of a, a well compensated uh, apprenticeship program to move over to the business side of things. But, you know, truthfully, I was uh, enjoying it enough, the actual work and enjoying the work that, you know, the opportunity um, never really was strong enough to pull me away from it. So I started out, you know, standard corporate M&A. Um, I was a uh, summer associate at uh, Steel Hector, which is an old Florida firm, might even be uh, before your time. And uh, their my first day uh, there, they were acquired by Squire Sanders, um, so which is now Squire Patent Boggs or something. Um, but that was not a that was not a great fit uh, because they really weren't emphasizing the corporate practice in South Florida. And South Florida is where I wanted to be, and corporate is what I wanted to do. So um, I had an offer from Ackerman to come and uh, work in their sports practice. And relatively quickly, I pulled the trigger on that and uh, ended up at Ackerman Fort Lauderdale and worked in the sports field for the South Florida sports teams uh, quite, a, quite a bit uh, for a while. But uh, 
ultimately the opportunity came along with cannabis and it was, you know, such new territory and, you know, such an interesting and fast moving field that it kind of pulled me, pulled me away from sports. Um, you know, sports in the NFL, you have, you know, really 32 teams that could potentially become clients. Uh, even some of those aren't really workable uh, just because, you know, they like having the local in front of them and want, often have partnerships with, you know, local offices that maybe we didn't have. So that became a little bit more difficult to navigate and cannabis was honestly exploding. And I, I found myself uh, gravitating toward that field. And uh, it, frankly, it hasn't slowed down. In fact, it's only become, you know, more and more of my work as time has gone on. Well, I mean, you made a great transition because if you were working with sports during the pandemic, I mean, a lot of them didn't play or they had shortened <laughs> seasons and everything else. And cannabis just exploded. You know, we, we, it was deemed essential. Sales went up before everyone thought it might've been a temporary spike with people worried about the shutdown, but it continued to grow. It grew through the pandemic and it's gotten bigger since the pandemic. I mean, I, I would love to say I read a bunch of articles. I don't have that kind of time with the two kids anymore, but I did see a bunch of headlines that said that sales in different geographies were up since the pandemic. So, you know, obviously your career path took you in the right way. I need our listeners to understand that you are responsible for Stephen Ross owning the Dolphins. So if they're not a fan of that, that, uh, you know, they, they can find you at the Fox Rothschild office. And no, I'm just kidding with that. But uh, to be fair, to be fair, we, we represented Wayne in that one. All right. <laughs> so. Okay. Um, but no, you know, going from sports into cannabis, exactly how, you know, with cannabis, it, it always seems to me, especially with the attorneys where, you know, you have someone who's in your circle, usually a friend or a potential client where they want to get involved in cannabis, but they're worried and you're the only person they know to talk to because you, you just happen to have a relationship with them. Right. Um, where it's like, Hey, I'm thinking of doing this. What do you know about it? And at that point you kind of have to be like, well, let me go look because I don't know. We haven't worked in this arena before. And, and I don't remember how many years ago you got in. I think it was like four, but um, you know, how exactly, what was there a singular deal that brought you in was an existing client. I mean, there is a very close relationship between sports and cannabis that is unspoken of, if you will, right? And it is, it is being exposed now. And I know there are companies that exist that are going to, to bridge that gap. But I imagine that maybe something you can't tell us was behind the scenes that pulled you into, into this world. I honestly was an existing, it was an existing firm client where cannabis was not their core business. It was almost... I, I don't want to say a lark, but they kind of had the agricultural infrastructure to do it and, you know, got into it, not a high level of an investment, probably 2% level of investment of what they would, of what it costs today uh, to really get something up and running. So they used their existing infrastructure and were an original licensee and, and then turned around and sold it, um, you know, just because they felt like it was a good time to sell. Um, and, you know, it, it very well may have been a good time uh, for them to sell, but I would say that the value of the business has, uh, has gone up uh, quite a bit from when they sold it. So I hope they got what they wanted in terms of the sale because I'm sure the buyer would uh, do that deal over again every day and twice on Sunday. So, the you know, on that note, the Florida market is very interesting, right? Because the people who were eligible for licenses in the initial lottery or whatever it was, you know, they were their farms or nurseries that existed here for a very long time, established businesses, which as a Floridian, I kind of like, we're protecting agriculture. I think the subset might have been a little small, but at the end of the day, it's interesting because a lot of these companies now had to take on a new product and figure out parts of the business that they never did before and do that for the entire state, 
right? So it was almost like it was set up for failure. I don't know if the original intention around this was to have regional players that happen to dominate their region. Obviously, it didn't end up working that way. But to me, to take someone who's a nursery or a farm, which most of the time is a wholesale business, right? And make them go all the way from wholesale through distribution and then retail to the end customer, make them deal with a whole bunch of processes and procedures they're not used to, softwares they've never dealt with, having physical real estate of a, of a retail store. I feel like that was set up for failure. But is that why we see in the state of Florida, we're, we're in MSO state? because a lot of these original companies didn't really have the capacity or bandwidth to truly fulfill the needs of that license, got a nice offer from someone who had a few bucks in their pocket, and those people were able to have the millions of dollars of cash to actually invest in this state and get to where they are now. I mean, I feel like that was the reason that we are where we are in Florida, where we have, I think, one non-MSO in the state with the flowery and everybody else being a, a true MSO. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the flowery comes from the uh, agricultural background. Yeah. So, it, you know, it's interesting. And this just goes to vertical integration. And, you know, there are as many people as you ask, you're probably going to get that many different thoughts on <laughs> vertical integration. But you're forcing, you know, we're farmers and cultivators to process, you know, and, and reduce to oil and then retail. Uh, neither which you'd consider a, a core competency. Um, and then you had a rash of people coming in that had experience in retail, but really didn't have the in-house capability for cultivation and, and processing. So this, the whole thing with vertical integration to me is it forces companies to go outside of their core competency. Um, you know, it, there are very few companies, I, I think, in Florida that are able to do what I would consider, you know, all three levels, cultivation, processing, and dispensing at a, at a high level, uh, as if it were their core competency. So, yeah, it, a lot of what that results in is a lot of licensees have certain operational weaknesses um, that they have to overcome either with acquisition of talent or thankfully experience uh, if they're going to get out of that organically. Yeah, it would have been interesting to see them, you know, to see vertical integration get broken up. I know one of your colleagues at Ackerman was working on that. It didn't, it didn't happen, you know, to me, and, and I know you may or may not be able to answer this because I do know that you do work with TrueLeaf, but I feel like companies like TrueLeaf at this point in time don't really care about their, their vertical integration being protected because they're a phenomenal retailer, not that they're bad at the other things. And I can see them benefiting from having other brands in their store. Right. And I feel like some of the companies, maybe the ones that just came in still want the protection, but they had a hell of a head start. And I would love to see a lot more craft growers start here and have their, their, their cannabis in AYR, in truly in move and everywhere else. And I think that would be really good for the state. I, I don't think we're going to get there anytime soon. In fact, I think it was an article under your page um, on the Fox site that was saying that something was just recently blocked for the upcoming ballot that we're not going to be able to vote on. Do you? Uh, yeah, the the MILF uh, home grow uh, ah. ballot initiative was, uh, yeah, was uh, shacked into the stance by the uh, Florida Supreme Court um, for, uh, for vagueness. It was a pretty tortured argument if you ever want to go back and if you have trouble sleeping you can go back and read their decision it's not very long and it's uh frankly not very good right. <laughs> so from what you're seeing in the industry right i've always kind of had this this we had a lot of MSOs pop up very early on and kind of, to me, grew like tech companies, right? It was more about market share and gaining real estate and everything else. And then there were other companies. I think we can put truly in this category, even though they spread like wildfire in Florida, they stayed in their lane in Florida, built a very good business, a profitable business, cash flowing, if you will, and then started going to other states. There are a lot of other businesses in other states that we can start to identify like that too. Companies in Colorado that built, you know, 10, 12 stores in Colorado before moving into another state. You know, 
from your experience, this to me is an agriculture and CPD, CPG industry. It, it's not like tech. And I feel like a lot of startups fall into that. We can be like Uber or Lyft and, and hemorrhage cash and, and be worth a few billion dollars. And that's no, because with tech, you can get market share and then put on a paywall and boom, you can flow money with, with this. It, it's CPG, it's retail and all that. Do you see the advantage in the companies that kind of did their thing, focused on what they did well, made sure it worked before going for market share? Are those the type of companies that you are seeing be successful now and the ones that are hiring you to expand at this point? Like, is that where we are? Yeah, I think I think the companies that have been most effective, you know, haven't a- approached it like tech. Um, I don't even know how you really can in Florida because you have to have a product to grow and deliver. And that's, you know, that's dirt and picks and shovels. And, you know, tech can generate from an idea. It it can be low cost and then scale up. Here, if you don't start with your scale, you're, you're chasing it. Or you're like a number of these companies that have a license and are minimally operating waiting for capital or waiting for something that they can't quite point to in order to get them to start opening up dispensaries, start grabbing market share, start getting to market. You have a lot of companies that aren't really effectively competing and are just at best treading water. Um, I think it has to start with the scale and then, uh, and then come to the consumer through, through that route. Interesting. So for these companies that are starting to expand, you know, they did well in their state. I know that you've worked in Nevada and other states besides Florida. Florida obviously is where a lot of the big dogs are. But, you know, what when they want to expand into other states, you know, what should they be looking for when 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 M&A comes across in the cannabis world? You know, is it oh, my God, they have a great grower, they have a great product or they're great at retail or people looking to fill needs? You know, what would you say? people should look for when doing m a you know as far as looking for help doing that right i'm sure there are plenty of ceos out there that said i built this business from the beginning i know what to look for in another company you know where do where does outside counsel fall into this as far as making sure that mistakes are not made especially when you're now going to be operating in more than one market that is not homogenous as far as regulation i think one of the first things that you know, you want to you want to look for is a repeatable customer base. If you're acquiring an existing entity or dispensary, you're you know how how regular is your customer base? How quickly are you able to sell? How recurring is the customer base? And that'll give you you know some faith in the numbers of what the business is producing. You also want to there's always an uncertainty gap because there's so much growth in the industry that people's recent numbers may outpace their historical numbers. So you want to separate what's flash and what's real. And also that you're, that the value's right because people are going to price their company based on what the numbers they are doing in a light that's most favorable to them. They'll take a larger sampling of sales records if they're, you know, if they've been scuffling recently If they've been hot recently, then they'll use that time period to sort of price their asset. So you wanna make sure that the gaps are are closed and that you're not buying into a flash and that it's repeatable business. Um, It also depends where you are in the supply chain. I was just speaking to dispensaries, but if you're looking to establish a grow, you know, then the question is, are you planning to add on dispensaries? Are you planning to wholesale? You know, if should that jurisdiction allow it, it's not every jurisdiction that permits that. And do you have an existing customer base and contracts? Uh, and how enforceable are those contracts? Are those contracts terminable in 30 days so that they're barely worth the paper they're written on and your business can walk out the door once it changes ownership? Or are these guys that are you know locked in buying at a certain level for years at a time and will give you time to get integrated into the area and you know, grow your own customer base separate and apart from what's existing. So where they are on their contracts, where their customer base is and how they're valuing themselves are all something to be taken in consideration and where 
you fit and this entity fits as a target in that supply chain. Probably a little bit more educated than from my knowledge, but it, I mean, to me, it just seems like you want to have experts to know what to look for. I mean, to me in this industry, because of the regulations, because of the lack of banking and, and everything else, and that there's a lot of smoke and mirrors sometimes it seems like, you know, you can be saying, and let me ask you a question with this, you know, on a, in a typical world where you're dealing with M&A and you're going to acquire a company, there are audited financials from, you know, usually a pretty notable CPA firm, right? You have certain things in traditional industries, and I'll say traditional because it's not a schedule one drug that are kind of the bare minimum when you're going to list your company for sale or you're looking to be acquired. Are we there yet in this industry? Like how, what are we evaluating cannabis companies on at this point? Is it their, you know, is it revenue? Is it profit? Is it, uh, you know, assets? Is it a combination of everything else? What has set the precedent? Because, you know, the public market to me is, is I don't know. To me, it just doesn't seem connected to the, where the private is right now. So, and, and I have no reason to say that whatsoever, except for being a crazy idiot with a camera and a microphone. So I'm curious to get your take on where this industry is from a normalization standpoint, as far as things like audited financials and, and all that good stuff that, that is laid out for somebody acquiring the business. Well, if you're a Canadian public company, you're going to have your audited financials. Uh, you still have a lot of players in the space that don't have audited financials, that don't necessarily do their financials uh, on a gap basis. And so when you have a public company, for example, approach and say, okay, let's see your financials. And I assume they're gap and I, you know, assume they're audited and they go, oh, no, no, no. We have, you know, our, our aunt doing our books and uh, she's heard a gap, but we don't do that. You know, she's you got have a gap to, in her teeth, but that's about it. Um. <laughs> you have to be able to, you know, go back and uh, effectively, you know, redo the financials to the to the extent you can to make sure what you're seeing is real, because there will be uh, there will be differences. It's not as corporate and as professional as uh, as you would think, unless you're dealing public company to public company. You're you're still you're still dealing with what what I'd say would be unaudited. Uh, and in some cases, non-GAAP financials. I, I feel like to that point is, you know, you want to do everything you can to protect yourself, but there's still a lot of trust that needs to happen in this industry. And I mean, the good thing is, is the good players in this industry seem to be pretty good at collaborating and everything else. I know there's a lot of bad players too, but it, it is interesting just where we are and because of a federal regulation on us that, you know, a lot of that's not available and there are a lot of additional costs that, you know, it'd be nice to have audited financials, but that it's a lot of tax and everything else involved that you have to pay first. So I'm curious to know, putting your speculation hat on, you know, where we are right now from a regulatory standpoint, we see all these different markets that are regulated in so many different ways. Interstate commerce is obviously not a thing. We don't have safe banking. They threaten to pass safe banking all the time. They keep threatening all these reform bills that pass one house and don't go to the other. I don't know about you, just a little tangent here. I have so many friends that will send me all these articles on federal legalization bills. And this one, like, isn't this exciting for you? I'm like, if I had a dollar for every time someone said that to me, I wouldn't need to work in the industry anymore. I'm like, I've seen it pass one side and never go to the other. How far away do you think we are from this just becoming more normal potentially wreck in Florida, wreck other recreational markets, federal legalization. And, you know, for me, I know this is a very loaded question, so I might need to write it down so I can ask you all the parts again, but I federal legalization right now scares the crap out of me because it's not going to be done right. It's going to be rushed. It's going to be regulated horribly. The MSOs love you guys, but they're going to get full advantage and they're going to be able to dominate the space. It's going to be the little guys that are going to suffer. So I'm all for the decriminalization and letting the states kind of regulate themselves until they figure out a model that works, right? Kind of let things go as they are. We're not going to arrest you. Maybe keep it within your state boundaries for now, you know, and do it that way. What are your thoughts on what is probably the most beneficial to the industry going forward of how to legalize and, and timelines that you would speculate that that may or may not happen? 
Um, I think descheduling a, a lot flows from descheduling or even rescheduling. Um, I think that takes a lot of the federal heat off of cannabis and a lot of things will, will flow from there. Uh, I think that's the best step they could do in, in whatever they end up doing. But, you know, you mentioned people sending you, you know, all these news articles about, you know, some, some senator introduced something and it's, it's so far from happening and turns into such a political football that if you do bother responding at all for your sanity, I would just respond with, we'll see. Yep. Um, and, and take that approach. But I would, I would love to, you know, see cannabis uh, descheduled. Um, Clarence Thomas made some commentary about, hey, maybe we should just give this back to the states and the federal government just steps out of this. Um, that's one possible solution. I'd, I'd like to see a comprehensive, you know, federal legalization, but you are right in that they're probably going to mess up the rollout and further cloud everything. And I, I think you can talk to lots of people in the hemp business, separate and apart from the MJ business, about how the farm bill and the FDA back and forth, what that's done to them. And they, they wouldn't have too many nice things uh, to say because the supply and demand went completely out of whack in, uh, in the follow-up to that farm bill. And then they're trying to make products and the FDA is yanking them this way and that to the point where right now they're, you know, they're really asking to be regulated. Um, you know, just please give us some guidance and we adhere yeah. to it. And they're kind of left in the wilderness. So I think, I think all things being equal, a descheduling is a good first step that the federal government could take. Um, I'd like to see the, uh, you know, expungement of non, nonviolent marijuana offenses occur as well. Um, I feel like that's just the right thing to do. And, yeah. you know, beyond that, I kind of wait with bated breath to see what the federal government will come up with. Yeah, I'm, I'm all with you, man. I think those things are very important to this industry, expungement, social equity licenses, making sure, you know, the people that were marginalized from the war on drugs get taken care of. And I believe, and anybody who's watching this can say whatever you want. I believe that the federal government federally regulates it. A lot of that stuff is not going to get done right. It's going to get done for a PR move. It just, and, and at the end of the day, when we look at the lockdown, and this is my opinion, not the opinion of everybody else's, but they've supported big business and, and, and small business is what suffered from this. And I have no doubt in my mind that if they federally legalize it and in the beginning, big businesses will thrive and the small businesses and the ones that are getting their social equity license and everything else, although they got the license, they're going to be regulated out of competition. And that's my fear. Is it, is it justified? Probably not. But like I said, you know, they, uh, they give you a piece of paper at the beginning of your life and says, keep this on you for the rest of your life. It's your key to your life in the United States. And it's literally this big. It's not even fucking laminated. So I can't trust them. Right. Um, <laughs> that's my joke. You know, you want the people to handle your money that they gave you the social security card that created the DMV. But so that's where I am, man. I, I listen, I, I think, you know, a lot of the work that you're doing is incredible. You know, I know that you do a lot of the work with, with true leave, helping them expand into different markets. You know, what are the things this year, whether it's with Fox or true leave, or just as a fan of the industry that, that you're excited to see or that you expect to see this year and next? Well, I'm, I'm fired up for all the new licenses in Florida. Um, you know, we just had a uh, VJ Choksi uh, just joined us um, this week. Long time C Lab board member. Yep, and probably the best. Listen, the best head of hair in C Lab. Maybe Fox Rothschild too. I haven't seen the heads of hair in your office, but definitely the best head of hair in C Lab for sure. It's a, it's a luxurious beard too. It'll put yours. It is to just an extension <laughs> of that beautiful hair. I I can't even grow one. I have to envy yours. Um, <laughs> so. <laughs> So, so I'm, I'm very excited for the licenses uh, coming online in Florida. A lot of new opportunities for applications that's been deferred because of 
you know, the Flora Grown case that did get resolved. Um, but I'm, I'm really looking forward to that uh, in the coming future. And, uh, you know, honestly, just more uh, entry into the market for the developments of the market, uh, you know, as it exists, not only in Florida, but throughout the country. I'm interested to see what New York does. I just saw an article today about New Jersey spitting, spitting the bit in that a number of towns have decided to not let cannabis in after what 67 percent it passed with and now you have you know just dozens of towns it seems like half of them saying hey we don't want it they, they should so... learn from massachusetts mistake massachusetts did the same thing where a bunch of towns said no 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 and you know only to reverse course later it's so dumb, especially for New Jersey, because New Jersey legalized first, which was a big move because most of the people who live in New Jersey work in New York. So now you have New York that's going to go full wreck, and it, it's already crazy there. I mean, you already, don't get me wrong, people are smoking weed on the streets of Manhattan since the 70s, but now it's normalized. Like, I mean, I, I was there, to, I'm, I can admit this. I'm not a fucking lawyer, right? I, I was in Manhattan and I was able to smoke a joint on the streets of New York and no one said anything because right now you're able to smoke cannabis anywhere that you can smoke cigarettes. Decriminalized, not legally, right? So if you're New Jersey, why would you let all that money that's going to come out of your citizens' pockets go to Manhattan, go to New York? I, that, I don't understand that. Maybe if they were on, on an island, not if it, you know if, they, if there wasn't a lot of rec markets around them, I'd understand it, but I don't understand why they would let that money flow to New York now. Yeah, it's um, I don't know. It's a it's a shame be, with so many people approving it. You just wonder where these towns are, you know, sort yeah. of getting the initiative to disallow it. Well, having said that, I remember I had a buddy of mine that got married in Ocean City, New Jersey. And I didn't even know that that was a dry county. So they didn't even have booze there, which blew my mind. I was like two years out of college and it was a wedding. And I remember like waking up Saturday morning for the wedding. I'm like, all right, dad, you want to watch the Knowles game? And, you know, we'll go to a bar, watch the Knowles game. And we'll go to the wedding. He's like, yeah, there's no booze in this town. I'm like, well, how far is Atlantic City? Because I know they have booze. And it was 15 minutes up the street. So we went there. But so I guess the people that don't allow booze, they don't want cannabis either. Uh, yeah, I, I guess that's the, the way they want to play it, which is, uh, you know, it's a real shame. I think they'll come around eventually, but they're going to miss, you know, this initial wave. And it is so capital intensive. I, that's, the, that's the one thing I want to point out about this industry and anybody looking to get into the industry is it really is capital intensive. Um, I, I don't think a lot of people appreciate that. Uh, even some companies that go out there and do acquisitions, they don't really budget for the build out. They'll just find more money later and then they run out of money because they, you know, blew their wad on the acquisition. Yeah. Um, I, I think that once those dollars are allocated to towns that are receptive, there's, you know, basically those other towns that reverse course later will just get the best of what's left, yeah. which may be a varying quality. No, it'll be interesting. You know, on that note, I, I don't know if you would know this or not, but I'm curious to know with, with Cuomo being forced to resign, is that going to affect legalization in New York at all? Because it was his administration that announced it or are the people in his administration still going to push forward with it, you know, because I, I don't think it was, it was solidified, right? Well, it, it hadn't been uh, signed in yet because he was using it as a political football. So yeah. Uh, to, to cover yeah. up what he resigned for. We get it. <laughs> I, no, he was trying to get his uh, MTA uh, bill passed ah. before he signed it and was basically holding it hostage. So, uh, you know, blank that guy uh, for a yeah. number. Of uh, I haven't heard the lieutenant governor who's stepping into his shoes, uh, you know, say anything one way or the other, but he's technically sitting in the big chair because his big resignation was two weeks notice. So he's still sitting there. He could still sign it theoretically, but uh, I haven't, I haven't heard anything definitive one way or the other. Yeah. I, I want that one to happen. Just, I, I feel like New York is 
a very huge victory for cannabis, especially Manhattan. And the culture has been there underground forever to bring it to the forefront. To me, New York is the nexus of the entire world. You know, anybody from another country, they come to this country, they want to go to Miami, they want to go to New York, they want to go to Los Angeles, but New York finance, fashion, you name it, it comes out of New York. So to me, that was a huge win. And I can't wait to see what cannabis does in Manhattan. All right, well, let me turn this one around on you then. What do you think of the fact that they're basically replicating the alcohol model, where you basically are going to separate your growers, your processors, your dispensaries uh, without any overlap, although there is some talk that they might consider allowing people to have dual licenses. But right now, it seems like the intention is to keep them separated at all times. I, I mean... I like, I, I don't like it. What I do like about it is that it allows people to focus on what they do well, and it gives a lot of opportunity for more people to get involved. So I do like that. And, you know, but listen, we all know the history of New York and, and the things that are involved there and the construction industry and everything else. So are they going to, are those opportunities going to the people who got them get fucking whacked if I say it this way, but you know what I mean? Is it, are they going to the people that are connected or are they truly going to go to the people that are out there? To me, it seems like, Maybe they're doing it that and this is turning into a fucking conspiracy theory podcast at this point. <laughs> but to me, the way that they would do it that way is so, you know, the, the people who have the contracts for the landfills and the construction companies and the scaffolding and everything else get their piece of the pie. I don't like forcing anybody to do anything a certain way. I don't like forcing vertical. I don't like forcing pure horizontal. I like people to be able to get in where they know how to do business and then kind of take on what they need to to be profitable there's at the end of the day i think every good company would end up being vertical at some in some way shape or form because you you help cut down on supply chain costs but i think it's naturally that they need to get there so to answer your question maybe i think i like it a little bit better than forcing vertical but i'm still not a huge fan yeah um I, I'd agree with that sentiment. I think that's a reasonable response is, you know, if someone has the best dispensary and can be the best cultivator, they should have a license as to those two. And if they get beat out on processing, they get beat out on processing, mm. but at least give them a chance to compete. Because, I mean, when there's competition, generally the people who win are the consumers. A hundred percent. I mean, I look at this way. You have a cultivator who thinks he's the best cultivator and you force him to have retail. Does he want to sell other people's weed? No, he doesn't. He's got an ego. He wants his own product out there. He's going to push it harder. But then you might have someone on the end of the supply chain that is just a huge cannabis fan. And they look at cannabis the way they, that people look at wine. And maybe they're phenomenal at curating a store full of cannabis. And to me, that person should only be in retail. Why make them grow a product when that's not what they enjoy or that's what they want to do? Then he's got to go and figure out out of all the different strains that he loves and all the different players that he deals with which one does he want to emulate in his grow because he's going to want to do all of it right so it doesn't to me that's why it doesn't make sense right there's so many different people especially historically that have had an affinity for part of this industry cultivators sellers things like that even consumers mm -hmm. that if we let people do what they do best that it would be the best version of this industry we'd have free markets you know not to shit on our state of florida but you know i have conversations with people and they see strains that are coming out 12 13 percent you go to california if it's under 25 they won't talk to you right and people ask me how they get away with that here i go because they can it's it's unfortunate it's because they can because you don't have a lot of competition for some people they have one dispensary within the geog geographical location in which they live that's where they're going and they're buying whatever's convenient or cheap or anything else right so when you don't have a massive free market that gets you better quality at a lower price you'll see the 12 13 percent strains here and don't get me wrong i personally enjoy some of them but then you know you have each to me i can't pick a favorite dispensary there's ones that i frequent more than others but i think everybody has good and bad i think everybody has that one two three strains that they do well they bring to the table and you know it's going to be great every time you see it on the menu but there's still a lot of variable elsewhere right I don't, I haven't seen a single person yet. There's just this banger after banger on their menu where no matter what you get, you're going to enjoy it every time. And, and including the people that I talk highly about all the time, they, they have plenty of misses. Fair enough. 
So yeah, I'm also I'm also eager to see how New York treats the hemp uh, CBD guys who you know have converted their existing agricultural stores over into cannabis if they're going to be receptive to them getting a license. Uh, frankly, they're probably in the best position to you know become marijuana cultivators at least of what's organically existing in New York yeah. right. Now. And whether they're going to be allowed into the party remains an open question. And, and I think that statement that you opened up with right there is, is what scares me the most about federal legalization is every time we see a new market, it's always, it'll be interesting to see how they do this, or it'll be interesting to see how they do that. We're always curious to know how it's going to go. So, you know, when we see a new market, that's just a particular state, come on, we, we can't even make the assumption of how they're going to regulate it and do it because nobody's seen one that they really want to replicate. So then we try to do that at the federal level and bend to everybody who's already gone out on a limb, legalized it, and worked very hard on the regulations, bending to this federal mandate. I just don't see that going well. Yeah. Um, speaking of regulators uh, aping rules from other uh, jurisdictions, uh, one state that uh, recently awarded some licenses just decided to copy you know, another state's regulations, chapter and verse, their original regulations that subsequently, you know, got litigated out of existence just because people repeatedly sued the state. Somehow this next door neighbor state looked at it and said, oh, that looks like a great idea. Let's do that. Yeah. And those are their rules. And I imagine it's going to go the same way. They're going to get sued into oblivion and they're going to have to get some new rules. It's, um, you know, it's frustrating to see the same mistakes get made, but when you're dealing with, you know, provincial governments, state governments, um, they don't necessarily uh, always see uh, the big picture when they first set foot into, you know, the cannabis realm of regulation. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, you know, there's random stuff, there's random thoughts that pop in my head as we're going through this. And, you know, we see a lot of politicians that quote, unquote, have our back and are, are pushing for this. But at the end of the day, you know, in politics, they can't talk about consumption, even if they're they're in a legal state, or maybe they can, I don't think they can, right. So I think people will be a lot more comfortable if someone came out, it's like, nah, yeah, I smoke a joint every day at the end of the night. This is what I do. This is why I want to push it through. You'd be like, Oh shit, like he is one of us because you know as well as I do, especially being a lawyer, there is a negative connotation on quote unquote corporate cannabis, wearing a suit to work and everything else. Where at the end of the day, and the argument that I make is there were a lot of us that were in the professional world that because of the stigma around cannabis, we consumed, we consumed as much as the people that enjoyed the culture. We just couldn't talk about it because there were professional licenses to lose, there were families to support and everything else. And you just, you know, I've had this conversation with a lot of people with with Paul Rosen, one of them, at, you know, from 1933. And, you know, it, it I feel like it's harder to get accepted into this world that way. Politicians, I mean, are, are the ultimate. That's that's the man. That's what this industry was created to fight. And I think if politicians were able to be and it's no fault to theirs, more open about their own cannabis consumption, because we know there are plenty of them that do it, it would make it an easier conversation for everybody and there'd be a lot more support. So I'm always interested to see the stigma being rolled out and, and, and who comes out of the closet, if you will, in that sense. Uh -huh. Yeah, the more, I will say levels of government and even at the, uh, you know, corporate MSOs, um, you know, it's always good to have uh, true believers uh, there in the sense that they really believe in the product of what they're doing, that it's not, you know, just a widget. Yeah. And, you know, what I, what I guess heartens me and not to necessarily cape up uh, for corporate cannabis is they are there and they, they are supportive mm -hmm. um, and they do, you know, want what's best for the consumer. And they believe that if they are able to do the best for the consumer, that it, that in turn will be the best for their company. So I, I will say their hearts and heads are in the right place. hundred percent. To me, it's always been, we both need each other, right? Yeah. The, the true cannabis folks need business people to show them the ropes, the regulate we're a capitalistic society, the regulations, the rules, they're not changing. You need people who know how to navigate those waters. 
And the people that are in corporate are just consumers and advocates and fans. They need the cannabis folk to teach them about the plant and, you know, the culture and everything else. It is very much a symbiotic industry in my mind that way, man. Listen, I've had you on for an hour. I know you charge a lot of money for that amount of time. So I'm going to have to let you go because we can't afford your bill. But Sean, it was a pleasure to talk to you. I know there's a ton of stuff that you're going to be working on this year that we're going to want to talk about. So we'll have you back again. Before I let you go, anything that you want to bring up, anything you want to promote, the floor is yours, my friend. No, not at, not at this time. I I really appreciate you having me on and uh, the opportunity to speak with you and uh, share this with everybody on your podcast. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining and thank you to everybody at home. I am trying to look at my calendar and tell you when the next episode is going to be. Next episode is going to be Friday morning at 10 a.m. with Gramco. Very excited to talk to them. Uh, folks, so tune in Friday, 10 a.m. That's going to be on LinkedIn uh, at Cannabis Lab, and it's going to be on Facebook at facebook.com slash cannabis group. Like I said, we're going to try to get back to a normal schedule again. Give me time. I've got two kids. My schedule is not great, but I am working on that. Of course, if you missed any of our live episodes, especially this one, you can catch it live on Monday on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash elevate your grind. Make sure you like the video and subscribe to our YouTube channel. That's how we're able to continue to bring you all this amazing content, folks. This has been another episode of Elevate Your Grind. Remember, if you want the best cannabis packaging in the business, go to contempopackaging.com and we will see you on Friday.